I'd like to introduce Lane Wigley, presenting Revisiting Power Provisioning for High Bandwidth Routers. Lane is a technical marketing engineer at Cisco and joined us, joining us on stage from North Carolina. This is Lane's first time presenting at Nanog, so welcome. Hey, thank you. Down to the end, I, um, I hope it's not because your flights got canceled, but uh, really appreciate everybody here this week. Um, if we can go to the first slide here. So I've been working with this kind of router since about 98 or so. And this isn't a pitch from, from my product, but it's just about a project that I've been working on uh, recently. And um, I want to kind of start the discussion so that at some future nanogs, maybe we can kind of talk about how we can um, find a better way to provision power, both from the, you know, what the routers are asking for, as well as how we navigate that in facilities and planning for cooling and, and things like that. So what are the characteristics of what I'm calling big routers? Um, they have modular fabrics, they have multiple numbers of, of line cards, um, lots of optics options. I'll talk about how that's um, becoming more relevant in the, in the range of optics that we have these days. Uh, modular power supplies, uh, my system has up to 24 power supplies you can put in it. And the other thing which I know causes a lot of challenges is that we often want the sheet metal for these devices to be in place for a while, two, three, sometimes even four or more generations in which their power is going to, to go up. And so from my view on the, you know, the vendor side is my understanding of your challenges is that goal number one is to prevent brownouts. Um, we don't want the system running out of power, obviously, um, but often we put in a lot of margin to keep that from happening and sometimes it might be, be too much. Um, when brownouts happen, they're not clean failures. Some transistor runs out of power, but it could be a different one each time, so it's not clear exactly what happened. Um, the other thing from provisioning is to accurately represent cooling requirements. Um, one of the common questions I would get from uh, people I work with, they'll say, you know, Lane, you told me I needed 10 power supplies, but it looks like I'm only using three. Why is that? And in some of the graphics in the next couple slides, I'm going to kind of explain why some of that is just how it is, as well as some of the things we can actually do, do better now that we have more and more variation uh, as well. Other things we want to do is minimize costs. Um, when I talk to a lot of people inside our company, they often think, okay, power costs 12 cents per kilowatt hour or something like that. They don't understand that in our world, we have cooling and PUEs and um, batteries and all this stuff. And so it ends up being a, a lot of costs. I, I tend to use, in my mind, $5,000 per kilowatt, or sorry, per kilowatt per year, just based on what some people have told me they pay for protected power from their, from their vendors. But it's, it ends up being a, a pretty big number. Um, another thing that's you know, really important is obviously fitting uh, in the budget. Um, for some of our um, partners, it's about having as many servers as they can on the area. For others, it's around um, you know, putting, in, you know, putting in more network equipment. And then the last big one, which I think is an operational challenge that I'd love for us all to have some discussion about, is this challenge about how not to get stranded. If I need 10 kilowatts now, but I might need 40 kilowatts 10 years from now, do I go ahead and start paying for those 40 kilowatts? Because what I really don't want to have happen is to need those 40 kilowatts and it's all gone. Or is there some way to have maybe options on the power or some system to make these reservations ahead of time? So there is some level of um, typical versus max power, which is just uh, unavoidable. And so here's a system, and I've, I've kind of blocked out my logos just for a little fun here. And this is, so this is one of the ones that I work with. And if you start on the left side with the green, uh, those are the line cards. And the line cards have some amount of power when they're just turned on, then as you add terabits per second or billion packets per second, they need more power. And those dark green are the difference between a typical power and a max power. Max power happens when you um, put small packets at 100%, you're putting more load on the chip. Uh, next to that, we have the optics. And one thing you're seeing increasingly being the case 
with 4 gig is that optics have a much wider range of power. What that graphic is showing is on the top you have some cards with gray optics for 4 gig, then you have some with coherent ZR plus optics, and on the bottom you have them with 100 gig optics. And so with 100 gig optics, we were really going from three and a half up to four watts. Now we're going from 12 watts up to 20 plus watts. So there's a huge range of what you could put in. And even in some systems you have um, uh, you know, copper cables. Um, on the right side, I'm kind of showing the range of power for the fabric. And each of these, each of these full blocks is 100 watts, just to provide some, some scale there. The difference between typical and max on the fabrics are usually not uh, as much. But the fans are where things get really interesting. Um, fan power is a cubic function of how much air you're moving. So if you're running a fan at 20%, that's, that's not a fifth as much power as if running at 100%. So what I'm showing here is the little squares on the left side, that's going to be your typical fan power. But if you need to step on the gas and go to 100%, you could be using 10 times as much fan power. That's kind of unavoidable. We want to have that in reserve in case the temperature goes up, maybe the chips get hotter, uh, etc but it's sort of unavoidable. There are some things we can do though. And one of the areas that I've been focusing on is how we handle optics. And this is for the, the platform I work on. Um, again, I mentioned that, you know, if you go back far enough, the optics were just on board. They were part of the card and we've always just budgeted them as part of the card. Even, you know, relatively recently, we would just assume that you had LR4 optics on all the ports and we would connect that into the system or into the line card. Um, but now if you look at some of the cards, I've got, I think one of those is mine, one of them is some other vendors, you know, we have maybe 48 ports on a line card or 36 by 400 gig. If you multiply by 36 by 36 ports by 22 watts for ZR plus optic, for another two watts you need to do some voltage conversion there, you're very quickly in the 800 watts of power just for, for these optics. But you might have AOC cables and copper cables and not need um, all of that. So the way I like to illustrate this is how we can prove our power allocation is, is kind of two ways. Um, on one hand, there's muscle, and on one hand, there's fat. The muscle is stuff that we might need, like the extra power for the line card if we get, go to 100%, or the extra power in the fabric 100%, or the extra power in the fans if we get a high temperature event. We really want to keep that available. At the same time, there's fat. Uh, we don't need power for ZR plus optics if you're running a DAC cable. And so what we've done on, on the platform I work with is we've actually moved to a model in which we don't start allocating power for the modules until you put them in. Okay. And I don't know if that's what everybody else does and we're just catching up, or I don't know if that's some innovation that I'm encouraging other people to do, but it's a model that gets us a little bit closer to reducing the oversubscription that we uh, or, you know, that we have been doing traditionally. Um, there's other things you can do. So for example, if you only put four line cards in the system, takes 12 line cards, you're actually gonna, if you optimize, have some things shut down on your fabric cards, you can actually take care of that transaction dynamically. Don't give the line card, the, the fabric cards full power until the line cards are, are put in. So you can do some things like, like that as well. Okay, so the goal is to remove as much fat as we can um, while having the system still, still operate. Another benefit of doing this, in addition to uh, saving how many power, you know, how pay your power bill at, at Equinix, is you want to keep your power supplies efficient. And this is just an example. This is probably um, pretty low, but a lot of times we don't always think of of, of the efficiency of the power supplies. Um, the power supplies on a lot of products today uh, are probably about 96% efficient from. 40% up to 90%, but if you find yourself running your power supplies at 15% of their load, they may be just blowing away 15% of their power just because the voltage conversion is not efficient when they're used, used so low. So having the right number of power supplies helps both in paying for less power as well as helps the environment and helps um, you know, generating less heat from that efficiency. So other things that we're thinking about as far as, you know, as we, we go forward, uh, you know, the discussion we could have is, you know, how do we treat empty ports? Are they just a missing optic or are they also, you know, some of the chips shut down? We could even cut that back even more. Um, how much margin are the facilities adding? Um, or are they oversubscribing? I could talk to somebody this week and said, it's kind of like an airplane. We sometimes sell a bit more capacity than we have. So we have to navigate how our system works as well and how the facilities work. Um, what is the optimal max temperature? 
Um, there's things that we could give you if the max temperature was 35. There's things we could give you if it was, was 45. Um, what's the right number? Um, when you think about this, there's really, if you want to minimize total power, you want to think about um, how much power does the system fans take? How much power does the facility fans cooling take? Um, how hot are the chips? Um, how hot are the CPUs? Because if the devices actually get hot, they'll start consuming some more power as well. So it's a balancing act between, between all of those. But getting back to how I was saying we, have, we tend to stack a lot of margin to prevent these brownouts, what we tend to do today is we have power so that we could lose a power feed and have the cooling go down and get small packets and go to 100% all at the same time. That might be the right approach. That in some cases, that's, that might not be the right approach in some other places. So we're trying to provide some tools so that you can make those, make those decisions. And then the last thing I think that's really important to figure out is how can we figure out a, some, some best practices to solve this problem of, well, I might need this power in the future, but it'd be really expensive for me to start paying for it, for it all now. And then there's a link to a, some blogs I've written on, on this topic and some other things uh, on uh, my site. Okay, thanks. Uh, Steve Ulrich, Risk Networks. Great presentation, Lane. Um, I wonder if there's also a tangential conversation here around how willing are folks to um, embrace kind of different physical form factor and hardware designs that uh, might facilitate lower power consumption overall. Like a lot of times we have conversations with customers where they're like, I want to pack as much stuff as possible in one RU. Right. But like if, like if we made the box three RU, it'd be a lot easier to cool. And like you're, you know, like you're trading off one set of things for another, but we can spin those fans slower. We can cool the box more efficiently. Like there's, there's more room for flex here. So I, I think, you know, speaking as a vendor, we'd certainly solicit to, uh, you know, they're curious as to, you know, what are the uh, trade-offs operators might be looking for in the future that way, too? Yeah, so maybe, maybe by a show of hands, I'm going to ask who, in general, is more RU constrained versus power constrained? So who is more RU constrained in general? Okay, so I'd see one and a half. Okay, and who's more power constrained? Okay, so a lot more there. So, so what that tells me is that maybe it's okay to make a two RU tour if the power goes down, or maybe a 2RU or something, and, and I was having a conversation with Jared earlier in the week, because by, by having bigger fans, uh, you can save money on the power on the fans, also by having bigger heat sinks, you can transform more, transform more, more air through. Um, so um, there's lots of, of things to balance out, but that's a, that's a great question, and, and that's excellent feedback. Other questions? Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you.